Okay, great. Over to me. All right. Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to this uh, very chilly evening. I say that because even if it's warm where you are, it's about to get a lot chillier. Um, anyway, um, you presumably know who Neil Spring is, which is why you've tuned in. Maybe some of you are not quite so sure, but we'll, we'll rectify that very soon. Neil Spring is the best-selling author of The Ghost Hunters, uh, which was adapted for ITV in the hit drama. Uh, the Watchers and The Lost Village, amongst others. Um, genuinely spine-tingling, sinister, serpentine, and clever, the critics have said about his novels. Novels that will undoubtedly have you turning the pages furiously till you get to the end, pulling up the blankets over your head when you go to bed and hoping you get a good night's sleep. <laughs> Me, I'm Stephen Volk. I wrote the TV drama Ghost Watch way back when in the prehistory of television. Uh, which went out as a live broadcast from the haunted house. And I was the uh, writer of a ITV drama called Afterlife, not the Ricky Gervais show that's now on, but the old uh, spooky one with Andrew Lincoln and Leslie Sharp. So tonight in the run up to Halloween, Neil and I are gonna be talking about horror and the supernatural on the page, on the screen, anywhere really, just a general subject. But very importantly, we are here to celebrate the launch of his new book, The Haunted Shore, which is published by spooky coincidence this very day. What's it about, you ask? Well, I think I could do worse than just read what's on the back of the book, just to fill you in. So I'm going to do that now. OK, here goes. When Lizzie moves to a desolate shore to escape her past, she hopes to find sanctuary. But a mysterious stranger is waiting for her her father's carer. And when darkness falls, something roams this wild stretch of beach, urging Lizzie to investigate its past. The longer she stays, the more the shore's secrets begin to stir. Secrets of a sea that burned, of bodies washed ashore, and a family's buried past reaching into the present. Wow, that has me hooked. I want to read it. Well, I have read it, actually. And I really want to talk about it. So, Neil, hi. Hi. How are you? I'm good. And I think this book, I think this book is undoubtedly your best novel yet. It really oh. had me gripped from beginning to end. I really loved it. Oh, and I can't wait to talk about it. But first of all, I thought we'd start by me asking you, really, the elephant in the room, or really the beating heart under the floorboards, if you like, which is the COVID-19 <laughs> pandemic that we're all suffering. Right. Uh, how, how, generally, how has that affected your working life as a writer and as a subsidiary kind of remark? Do you think that novelists writing now should accommodate the tropes of the pandemic into their modern set novels? I mean, things like social distancing, masks, and that kind of thing. Um, uh, I just like your feeling on that because it comes up in conversations between me and other writers. Well, OK, thanks for that, Stephen. And it's a great honour to be on this call with you uh, tonight, because for all, for everybody's benefit watching this, um, Stephen is really, really the master of British horror. Um, I hope you don't mind me, it's my saying, Stephen, and it's really in Why would I mind? Why would I mind? <laughs> Large part thanks to Stephen's work, um, most people be, will be familiar with um, Ghost Watch, which was a 1992 um, television Halloween night special with Michael Parkinson that really, um, I think it brought some, something like 30,000 complaints to the BBC, yeah. is that right? And it may put Stephen on the map and it actually was one of those uh, dramas that actually first instigated my interest in this whole genre. So um, thank you, Stephen. It's really a great honour to be on this call with you tonight. Thank you. Um, to answer your question, I mean, obviously, this is not how a book launch typically happens. Normally, ordinarily, we'd all be, you know, drinking wine in a bookshop somewhere. And um, tonight, yeah, we're drinking wine, or some of us are at home. But, you know, it's, it's a deeply, deeply unusual way to be like holding an occasion like this. So I'm really, really grateful to everybody watching this at home at the moment for taking out an hour of your Thursday night to, to be with us because this is a really difficult time, not just for writers, but everybody working in the creative industries at the minute are going through hell. And, um, you know, I think writers actually have it a lot easier than all the, all the actors out there, the poor performers who can't perform and do what they do so brilliantly. 
Um, but uh, to answer your question, writing, you know, it's a very, very solitary, um, solitary occupation and um, quite often involves a lot of isolation for writers who are at home working away. So in that regard, the COVID's changed very little. Um, you know, if you look at if you look the question of whether writers today should be putting the whole COVID epidemic into their work or incorporating it or what have you, I think it's unavoidable that you know this book in particular actually deals with the themes of isolation. Um, so it's un, it's it's unavoidable that that creeps in. But um, I've deliberately, although this book is set in the modern day, I've deliberately not included COVID because I think actually we're all completely sick of it and we've had a guts full of it a bit like brexit and i think people read to escape mm. and uh for that reason i've not i've not have not i, I think the same I, th I think it's actually in danger of could very quickly kind of let's hope anyway date your work if you're not careful um, so yeah. i think uh, that you could make an error in in the other direction really um the other thing i'd like to ask uh, to start off before we get into your career and books um, is that recently a critic in The Guardian said she didn't like anything spooky because guess what, quoting her, ghosts don't exist. And anyway, life, real life is too scary and horrific anyway. Why would you want to be entertained by something that scares you? Now, that's a huge subject. We could talk for the rest of the evening just on that subject. But how, do you, how would you react to that from a, um, a reviewer? Well, far be it for me to argue with... A guardian journalist but I I um my own view is that people don't come to read works of horror because they have a pre a predetermined belief or attitude towards the subject matter you know I don't believe that people watch The Shining or Carrie because they believe in telekine telekinesis or supernatural phenomena people read these stories I think a to escape um, and B, because people love to be scared. It's the same reason people go to the fairground. And, you know, what's deeply ironic about this question, you've, this, this comment that this person's made, is that, you know, ghost stories are fundamentally concerned with the living because it, 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 they are typically an analysis, I think, of um, the human condition. You know, they're principally concerned with themes like guilt and regret and conscience. What else are ghosts if not that? And uh, for that reason, I think people come to ghost, ghost stories and that, that's why people are attracted to them. It has nothing to do with believing in paranormal phenomena. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, I agree completely with that. Um, so let's get back to first principles, if I may. Um, could you give a quick kind of whistle stop tour of how you got became a professional writer your kind of uh, backstory if you like okay and I'm happy to do that and this may be uh, interesting to people watching who want to get into writing yourself or if you've got an idea for a book um, this could be uh, useful uh, so I got into writing around 28 when I was around 28 30 so um, about 10 years ago and um, it was purely because I had an idea for a story, which was a story about the ghost hunter Harry Price, who was a big historical figure in many ways. Um, and I came across a diary that belonged to a woman who had worked for him back in the 1930s. And I just thought that would make an amazing story. And so I went away and I felt compelled to write this story. It did you have, um, sorry to jump in, did you have prior knowledge about who Harry Price was? Or did yes, you yes. Oh, you no, I did very much so from my, from my youth, but I... I, I couldn't believe that nobody had ever dramatized the story of the haunting of Borley Rectory. I just couldn't understand that because it just felt like a such a fantastic tale um, because you had this, this chap who was investigating mediums during the interwar periods and debunking them, who then comes across the greatest case of all only to become the hoaxer himself. So I just thought that was a, that was a great idea and it stayed with me. Um, Actually, I was getting up before work because so I was working full time. I was working, I was writing it late, late into the evenings. And eventually I had a manuscript. And my was, that, what, was that while you had, were, were keeping down another job, I presume? Yeah, yeah. I was working for John Lewis full time. So it was quite a stressful period. But 
eventually I had a manuscript and this is the advice I give to everybody watching if you want to get published um, get your manuscript down first in full uh, because once your literary agent sees it they'll want to go through revisions and everything else um, but you know getting the agent is key and that's what happened to me so I, I sent off this manuscript or the first three chapters of it to lots of agents and I got rejected by pretty much all of them and then there were maybe three agents who showed interest and there was only one agent who was you only need one you only need only one, one. Only one. <laughs> and that was Catherine Hay Summer Hayes who's um, also Welsh uh, and she was at William Morris at the time and was she that the author no, Catherine no. Summer Hayes, no separate, yeah. Okay, some summer scale. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. but, but Catherine um, said, can you come into my office tomorrow? And I, 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 I thought, well, okay, yeah, great. So off I went. And, um, and then she signed the book and she sold it to Quercus. And then within a few months it was sold to a production company that then produced a drama and put it on ITV. Within a few months, that's well, alarmingly I, uh, a fairy tale like. <laughs> I, did, you know, I did pinch myself at the time yeah. Um, yeah, because it was rather extraordinary and it was only thanks to the amazing commissioners at ITV actually that it yeah. happened. Um, Could you tell me before we get into the TV adaptation very briefly because there's so much to talk about. Um, I mean, I love stories about ghost hunters. I think ever since I was in school, I've written about ghost hunters. It's something to do with some of the dramas I think I saw in the late 60s, early 70s on TV. Um, but I, I absolutely love the, the combination of kind of scientific rigor and the supernatural or the paranormal, the unexplained. I love the idea of applying uh, the best of human, the enlightenment, if you like, to pagan forces. Because I, I think in a way that's what human, the whole of human history has been about, you know, what, what you know, superstition versus, versus rationality, you know, and I just love that clash and I've always loved that in drama. Was that part of the uh, attraction for you? It was, it was an integral part of it, I think, that theme. And it was whilst writing the book that I realised that you had written the film called The Awakening. That's right, yeah. Um, which Rebecca Hall, I think, is in it. Is that yeah, right? Yeah. yeah, which I loved. And I think the BBC produced that, right? Yeah, they did, yeah. And I remember thinking, oh, for God's sake. They won't do, <laughs> you know, they won't do that. another one, will <laughs> they? Yeah. Here I am writing this book and <laughs> someone else who's already established has okay. got it already. Um, the funny but, thing about that is the kind of parallel of, you know, obviously I had no idea about that when I was, I wrote it, but. 10, 15 years before it was it was produced. But obviously the idea, the bizarre idea that you were writing something else in a parallel universe and you know that all that kind of thing does my head in really. But it's kind of it's kind of gratifying to know that people are beavering away in their different ways on these themes. I, I find it greatly inspiring and gratifying to know that we're all plowing these different furrows. Sometimes they cross over, and, but we get there in the end, you know. Well, there are some some great themes that never get boring, right? Um, yeah. I think this this whole territory and this genre is a fertile ground. And it, but just to go back to answering your 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 question on getting published, you know, and I think this is for the benefit really for everyone watching. Uh, it may look like a um, impossible task writing a novel, but if you get down a thousand words a day and you do that over the course of a year, you've got a novel. And I know that there are people watching this who are writing who want to get into writing. And so my, 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 the best piece of advice I can give you is just get it down on that page. Don't talk about it, just do it. And then the rest will follow. And I, I always say that have a regular habit. In other words, whether it's a day count or a weekly count, maybe because of circumstances, you can only work for three hours on a Sunday morning. Um, yeah. but make sure it's every Sunday morning and then eventually it'll get done, you know. Yeah. Um, eventually. <laughs> it's, uh, it's discipline. The one thing we always tell everyone about, but we can't do ourselves, though I'm speaking personally anyway, but <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> talk about uh, do as I do, don't do or do as I say, don't do as I do. But anyway, that's another story. Um, tell me a little bit about how I've been on. I haven't been on the receiving end of being adapted. I've only been on the uh, well, maybe it's receiving end in a different way. Being a person that's doing the adapting, uh, I, I adapted at, um, Phil Rickman's uh, book *Midwinter of the Spirit*, one of the uh, Murray Watson's books. ITV is a three-parter 
I love that. And I think I think Phil was pleased with it. You, one never knows, but <laughs> with an author. And it's a very tricky, from my point of view, adapting, it's a very tricky kind of relationship. How did you find that minefield of emotions? Were you able to say, right, my book is done, my book is on the shelf, no one's going to alter that book, you know, the rest of it is fun? Or, or were you, or were you, was it a mixture of emotions? Um, so I write every book I write, I, I write actually with it in mind for being adapted. And so you, therefore you, you create some sort of expectations along the way. And with the ghost hunters, I very much had, an, had a, my own view of the characters and how they would be portrayed on screen because they'd lived in my head for the best part of three years. Um, so sitting in uh, Pinewood at the read through, you know, with a, a bunch of actors that you know completely new to you, um, is of course you know it's 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 extremely um, odd, but it's also wonderful. And my my attitude to adaptations is that actually the book is its own thing; it will always be its own thing. But when you're writing for the screen, as you know, Stephen, you are doing something very particular, and it's necessary and vital that some things do change and actually look you know the producers out there i've worked with some amazing producers as i know you have and they they bring their own thing to it they bring their own life to it and that's great because they create something that hopefully retains the spirit of your work but then creates becomes its own thing as well and that's really good to see yeah i think i think you have to um as an author, you have to get used to the idea of people coming into the process and changing it. And as a screenwriter, you kind of live with that day in, day out. Yeah. And you've got to believe, and it is true, actually, that a lot of those people bring very positive, amazing things that you would never have thought of. Okay, sometimes it can yeah. be, the process can be a pain in the ass. But, but <laughs> a lot of the time, there are, there are much cleverer people, people than you coming to bear on something that you thought up you know in the dead of night or when you were on your own burning the midnight oil and here they are like 50 60 people all with their different jobs um, all standing around a set and I find that moment quite uh, extraordinarily magical really and almost a mystical kind of experience what was in your head a year and a half ago is now in reality you know uh, yeah and that that shock and joy of that never goes away really but um, but it must be strange if you Kind of lived on the interior of a book and you see the transformation i think you have to live with that transformation i think really but it, for some authors i think it's difficult yeah yeah but i i i, I have very much have to let go but one of the strangest experiences for myself was visiting the set of um harry price ghost hunter which is what itv and uh called the adaptation of the ghost hunters and that was just surreal um because you know you're standing in a it, it, you, it, in a set in a world that ultimately is, has something to do with something that you put down on paper. Yeah, that, that, the way I look at it is, you know, I think I said at the time when my first film was produced, the last time I saw this, it was inside my head. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, but anyway, we must move on because we've got a lot to talk about. Can I, can I, can I go straight to the Lost Village, if I may, uh, because there's a connection with Harry Price. Uh, you did write The Watchers, which is more about UFOs, so a slight diversion, although it's very much Neil Springs territory still, uh, you know, inspired by real events, real mem real kind of memories, half memories, and constructing something very particular to you. But yeah. The Lost Village <clears throat> was about Imba, which is on Salisbury Plain, and you can fill in the audience on what, what Imba was. And I'd like to ask you a really, you, you resurrected Harry Price in this, but you took certain liberties with history and the timeline. And uh, <laughs> yeah, that's really my question is, why was that necessary in that book? Uh, so for the benefit of everybody watching, The Lost Village is a novel I wrote about a, a village that was um, deserted at the beginning of um, the First World War. And basically everybody living in this village from Salisbury Plain was told they had to get out and they had a couple of days to leave. And they were promised that they could return one day, but that never happened. And to this day, Imba remains a military training ground. Now, um, the reason that Harry Price was a character which recurred in this book, and I had to shift the events to occur some 10 or 20 years later, 
was uh, primarily because my publisher said um, we want to have another Harry Price book uh, because the Ghost Hunters did so well. And that actually, bizarrely, the Lost Village did a lot better. Um, but uh, anyway, I, I don't intend to write any more Harry Price books at the moment, but uh, that's exactly how that book came about. And I think you were there, Stephen, at the launch in um, Wiltshire. Yes, that's right. But what I loved about that book was um, was a development of the of, of the character of the characters. It, it was like they went to a different dimension uh, in in terms of their personal life, uh, and I thought that was that was for me really hyped up the the, the involvement in the in the story. Really, um, I mean, I've loved Imba. We went on one of the open days because it's not that far from us, and it's a very weird place. I'm sure you you <laughs> have uh, realised that as well, but. Uh, that it is really place. I'll, I'll probably come back to this idea of, uh, you know, playing with facts and that kind of thing. In fact, I come straight onto it because I want to talk about the burning house, oh, God. Um, uh, <laughs> which invokes, if you like, Alistair Crowley in, as a as a kind of background character. And of course, uh, as you know, I'm really interested in him. I used him as character in a, in a, a novella called Netherwood, uh, which was really about Dennis Wheatley, but had Alistair Crowley as a uh, Kind of guest star, if you like, um, and because it interests me greatly, um, I wrote a trilogy of books about characters related to horror: Peter Cushing, Alfred Hitchcock, Dennis Wheatley. Uh, what appeals to you about melding fact and fiction? It was very much something that that I had a lot of. I got completely immersed in the idea of taking real characters but giving them fictional stories, um, and what I wanted to really explore with you a little bit is what are the disadvantages and what are the advantages what what gives you a buzz about that and what are the drawbacks well the drawbacks are that you you write something and you make a historical mistake and then somebody notices it yeah. and that, inevitably that. contacts you and i believe you me that's happened to me more than once uh you know you get an email from somebody saying oh they didn't have this technology in that year or what have you and and that's great and that's actually my fault as a writer if you if you get that wrong um but uh to answer your question um i think that we all have uh stories that we're familiar with in history that you know people may have heard of Imber, they may have heard of the lot of Loch Ness and the bizarre things that have gone on or alleged to have gone on in Loch Ness over the years um and so to write a piece of fiction that delves into that and and, and mines that territory is always quite interesting and one of the things I love to do in my work is to make throw in a few historical accuracies and then at the end, leave the reader thinking, well, what was real and what wasn't? Yeah. Um, and a couple of years ago, I was uh, at my gym training and I saw on the TV a new story on the BBC about a house that had burned down on the banks of Loch Ness um, called Bolskin House. Now, many of many of everybody watching may be familiar with this place, but um, I wasn't really, and I looked into it and it turned out, as you said, Bolskin House was owned by Alistair Crowley. Um, who many people regard as having been the wickedest man in the world, as you know, Stephen. Uh, and, and by the way, for everyone who's not read uh, Netherwood, um, you should read it because I think it's actually the strongest in your collection of the Dark Masters trilogy. And of the way in which you present Alistair Crowley is just spine tingling because he's obviously old and decrepit and dying, but he's still intensely fierce and dangerous. And how he comes across, I think, is brilliant. Um, but in, in my book, what I wanted to do was have his presence in the background um, rather than putting him in front of stage. And uh, I can say to everybody watching, I, I had to visit um, Bolleskin House uh, and I went there with a really good friend of mine and we you know, went around the area and we were one night we were sitting in the hotel and um, I know Guy's watching tonight, so he will confirm this is true, but we were sitting there and the waitress came over and she said, oh, um, are you going up to that house tomorrow? And we were like, yes, yes. And she said, well, I hope you don't mind if I say a prayer for you tonight. <laughs> at which point my mate looked at me and said, where have you brought me? <laughs> the shades of the slaughtered lamb. <laughs> exactly. But this is, a, this is a wonderful thing about these stories. You know, um, they infect local 
folklore. But it sounds like it in a way it's it's um, I think an extension of what all fiction is, which is playing a game of what if, except you're playing what if with uh, elements of, of reality, which gives an additional kind of frisson to the game that you're playing. Really, now, that's how I uh, I would completely it. agree. Um, so let's come let's come on to the reason that we're gathered here, which is the haunted shore. Um, we haven't talked about this prior to this conversation. So could you tell me a little bit about what inspired it? Yes. Um, so for the benefit of everyone watching, the book actually follows a, a woman called Lizzie Valentine, who's returned home to care for her gravely ill father, only to begin envisaging um, what can only be described as spirits and uncovering some rather nasty secrets about her family's past. So the title of the book may be a little um, deceiving in that regard, because this is really a novel about the father-daughter bond um, and the horrors that can come with old age and dementia and isolation and loneliness. So <laughs> it's not exactly <laughs> a walk in the park light read. But it's, um, you know, it isn't, uh, it's also a page turner. Let's say in your defense before let's just give a question that it, it's a page turner um oh. as well you know um and i you know i wouldn't let you let people to get the, the idea that it's a it's a kind of a slog it's not at all it's actually i found the um the setup of the family relationship and her going to to um see what's happened to her father was was really involving incredibly involving um so hats off to you for that um um, if I were to give some words that I associate with your novels, I'd say, and this is, you can knock me down if you like, uh, lost sp spaces, forbidden places, secrets, the past, memory, and trauma seem to be recurring uh, ideas in your, in your books. Um, there's all, always, I think, a terrific sense of place about your stories. Is that especially important to you? And if so, can you put a um, can you put your finger on why that why that is in the kind of stories that you tell? Sense of place. Yeah. Uh, that's a really good question. So um, I think it's probably fair to say that all my books usually begin with a sense of place. Um, they come to me like um, I guess they suggest themselves and then they intrude long before the characters who ever step forward to inhabit them. Um, and I, I think, think just, includes... sorry, just to be specific for a quick second, does the, does the place come first or do yes. you, you kind of have the story mulling around and then you find the right setting for it? So, so, I'll, have, it I'll, both ways? so I'll have a story uh, kicking around in my head. And in this case, this was a story about a caregiver who insinuates her way into a family's life. Um, but the location for me is really, really key. And I think especially with ghost stories, that's a good thing because evoking a sense of place is crucial to understanding a world that we can believe in and at the same time a world that we have to doubt once the darkness inevitably encroaches as it always does in, in, in a ghost story. Um, and this book in particular is set at a place called Shingle Street which is a very remote part of Suffolk. It's a coastal hamlet um, which is utterly isolated and desolate. It's a place where the military, the British government uh, tested their atomic bombs initially, um, lots of military secrets associated with this place. And the first time I turned, I went down there and I felt its eeriness and listened to the pull and push of the waves. I just knew there was a novel waiting to be written at this place. I can't describe so it. You, so you kind of fired away in a sense, this is that this is my setting but the, the story itself came from other influences, you would say? Yes, um, I've, always, I've always thought there's, um, I think one of the greatest horrors that we have in, in society actually is the um, abuse of old, old people and elderly people. And um, amongst all the heartbreaking reports of aged care, there are always, I think, many cautionary tales and chief amongst them probably are the dangers that can come by entrusting a loved one to the care of strangers. I think that's... There's, the, there's a, the, the very obvious kind of physical uh, sense of dread about that and, and physical horror. I think there's also the mental, psychological side of that, which is when, when someone's uh, succumbing to dementia, you don't know whether you can believe 
what they've said they've experienced or you know I, I've had experience of that with, with my mother quite quite often it was it was akin to someone having hallucinations or thinking someone had visited them or had to have because such and such was missing and you don't know where you are so reality is kind of fact fractured with uh, is the ideal territory being mercenary about it for a ghost story uh, so so I think uh, thematically those things really knit together very powerfully in your book um, would you like at this point to read a little extract to give people a taste of? Uh, I'd love to read a short extract for people um, but I won't I won't make it very long because um, I think that these events are always much more interesting as a conversation rather than listening to um, somebody read. Uh, but the novel begins, I shall read you the first page. Have you ever visited somewhere and known in your core that there was something terribly wrong about it? Somewhere that felt not just uncomfortable, but which provoked a mental shiver and caused the hairs on the back of your neck to prick up. The sort of place you could quite easily imagine was once the scene of an appalling, tragic incident. Well, the events I'm telling you about the horrors that I now feel compelled to share happened somewhere very much like that, a lonesome place where the skies seem permanently veiled in gloom, where shells whispered secrets of buried sufferings and dark waves threatened your sanity. I first saw this isolated stretch of shore when I was 12 years old, clinging to my mother's hand as we watched removal men lumber up the steps to the lonely Martello Tower with our furniture. I suppose Shingle Street became my home then, but I never thought of it as that, and never wanted to. The tower confronted the North Sea, an endless grey folded into brooding mist. It can't always have been that way, of course, but that's how it stained itself on my memory. My dad always said something about this location was magical, and maybe he was right, but not in a good way. There was nothing here, no shops, no pub, just a row of battered Victorian Coast Guard cottages strung out along a shingle ridge. And about a hundred yards away, separated from the shore by a lagoon-like stretch of water, Orford Ness, the island of secrets, abandoned, forbidden, its looming structures rising darkly against the bruised sky. A bleak, desolate place to make a home. Anyone reading this might think it an exaggeration. Um, but, the stark truth, but the stark truth is this. Those who live near this lonesome shore, where the gulls scream and the fog rolls in thick, had at least a vague idea of its strangeness, a place where weirdness was multiplied. Now, I know that better than anyone. So that's how the novel begins. Um, and it's probably the first thing I wrote as well, actually. I, I can remember writing those first pages about two years ago. And the novel went through, I think, two rewrites. Uh, it's clocked in at 370 pages, which is uh, my shortest book. Um, and it felt like a real journey, but uh, partly, you know, there, there, are some, there are some very odd coincidences that can occur when you're writing a book. And I know you've this is experience, you've experienced this, Stephen. But I started writing the first three chapters and I'm hopefully not giving too much away to everybody watching when I say that one of the main characters um, suffers a stroke. Now, it just so happened that as I wrote that, my own father had a stroke. And I just remember thinking, you know, I came back to Wales to see him at the time. And I'd just written the first three chapters when this had happened and I thought, and I'm not trying to imply that there was anything odd or unusual going on here, but it, it does strike you, synchronicity, when these things happen, it, it really does, you know, strike you as peculiar. Um, so it was, for me, it was a deeply personal book. Um, but you can, hopefully... you can really, you can really, you can tell that, and I love that opening. I mean, I was absolutely hooked by that opening. It's really beautiful. And it reminded me of <clears throat> really the masters of the genre, like M.R. James, you know, who, you know you're, you're you know you're in the hands of someone that's going to take you somewhere when when you when you open the book like that. It was really oh, nice. Nice. Um, uh, funny enough, I, I'll throw this in as a little kind of side story. When I was writing another word about, um, I was writing a little part of it about um, Alistair Crowley's um, 
memory or rather other other characters talking about him about where he lived off Piccadilly during the blitz and that he he lived um, uh, above a brothel <laughs> off Piccadilly when when bombs were dropping on um on London and just as I was writing that very sentence about bombs dropping on London uh the house shook and the lights flickered uh and um and I, I can cor corroborate that fact because an earthquake had happened I mean I, I felt really strange I thought Jesus you know wh why on earth would the house shake when I'm typing about Alistair Crowley <laughs> during the blitz in London but in fact oh, it, was a, it was a it was an earthquake with the epicenter in Bristol which is quite close to me uh, and it was February the whenever it was I made a note of it um, but it was a very peculiar feeling when things like that happen. When you're, funnily enough, when you're immersed in stories that maybe not so much supernatural stories, but certainly stories that flirt with kind of Satanism, you start to have a, a, a kind of sensitivity to <laughs> coincidence that I think goes above and beyond. But can we talk about your sub subject matter now in the second half uh, a little bit more? Did you grow up with the supernatural in fiction and who are the great authors? Um, somebody earlier on, Becky Hodgson, asked, uh, who are the great authors uh, that were an influence on you? Hi, Becky. Um, thanks for that question as well. Um, do you know, my favourite ghost story of all is a short ghost story called The Signalman by Charles Dickens, um, which is, I mean, I know you know it, Stephen, but... <laughs> it's absolutely perfect. It's one of my probably top 10 perfect stories you couldn't improve it you know you couldn't improve it could you it's a perfect perfect thing and it's perfect because far from being a, a traditional uh, ghost story about someone seeing the vision of someone who's dead it's actually a story about someone who has a premonition of their own death <laughs> um so it's it, it appears to be something it isn't what it, and it's very very clever so that that story really um galvanized me also my interest came from uh, I'm reading um, historical reports of alleged paranormal happenings and when I was at Oxford I wrote a thesis about the uh, significance ph philosophically of <clears throat> these sorts of events because uh, I was interested to know well why do people believe in phenomena which just seems to be so unlikely because it's so rare um, and I thought could it ever be justifiable or reasonable to believe that such things could exist uh, and finally concluded that actually a really interesting way to explore that question would be through uh, the medium of fiction, which took me into writing. And of course, you know, growing up in South Wales, um, I grew up, uh, so I was probably 12 when your show aired, when, when, um, when Ghostwatch went out, I can remember sitting in front of the television say, <laughs> thinking, oh my God, what's this? What's going on? Um, <laughs> So I would be lying if I said that wasn't an influence. Uh, and of course, I, I grew up reading uh, Stephen King, um, who didn't. <laughs> uh, but I think I, Becky specifically asked if you read James Herbert. That yes, was and I was about to. I was about to say, do you know? I I haven't actually read any James Herbert until. Um, somebody compared my work to <laughs> James Herbert's work a few years ago, and then I did, and I loved it. I thought, uh, and I also thought my work was nowhere near as good as his. <laughs> um, but uh, what about Don't you, Don't worry about that. Don't worry which, about that. Which, which horror authors did you... Um... Well, I kind of grew up on Dennis Wheatley, you know, because I'm a lot younger than you, but, um, uh, you know, so I grew up in the 60s with Hammer films, and uh, I guess I'd started to buy handbooks of horror stories were all the rage at that time so so then i experienced edgar Allan poe and hb uh, lovecraft through those anthologies of ghost stories or fontana book of ghost stories and that kind of thing really before i got to novels actually and then into the into the 70s it became the exorcist and stephen king and that kind of thing you know so much of the same much of the same background arthur macken of course the great welsh uh writer of the uh peculiar if you like and um you know all the classic Conan Doyle, you know, supernatural stories and that kind of thing. You, know, you mentioned like, Dennis Wheatley. Do you think that The Devil Rides Out is prime for a reimagining? Um, uh, I'll answer that tactfully and say yes if they ask me to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't we both do it? If they ask anyone else to do it, no, terrible idea. <laughs> <laughs>
Okay. So, did you, when you were um, considering, it's, I think you probably already answered this question, but did you always want to write with a supernatural element in your work or did, was there any time when you thought you might get into a different genre, say, you know, more, more crime or thrillers or any of, uh, of those kind of things? Did you flirt with any of those kind of thoughts? Uh, I've often thought about it, and, uh, but to be honest with you, um, this subject matter is what comes first to me. I don't really quite know where it comes from, but, um, you know, they say write what you know, and this is certainly a subject I know back to front. Um, and so I find it easier to mine ideas in this territory. Uh, but as a writer, you know, often you, 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 I'm sure you experience this as well, Stephen, you know, you, you see things and you think, oh, that would make a terrific story. And I've worked in the corporate world for 20 years. Uh, the number of stories you could, and I know many people on this call will be able to relate to this, you know, the dramas that you see sometimes play out in an office, um, right before, you know, for mining, but um, there's just something about this territory, which I think takes you away. I think you've got to be true to what draws you. I think that's, yeah. the, that's part of, people talk about finding your voice, but unless you find what you're passionate about in, in, times, in terms of the core of material that you're attracted to, and the clue is the things you get excited about watching or reading is the clue, you know, <laughs> um, so don't deny the things that you're, that, that you get, get um, excited by, you know, that's obviously what, where, where you should go, I think. Um, it's, it's only kind of commercial imperative that would drag you away from that. Someone saying, why don't you do this? Why don't you do that? But I'm very much kind of follow, follow your heart, really, because that's, that, that's where you get the integrity in the stories, I think. Um, well, I, I completely agree with that. And I'd say to everybody watching this, anybody who is interested in, in writing, you know, write about what, you're, to echo what Stephen said, write about what you're passionate about. Uh, because it just makes it all the easier. Um, and somebody it, said it's to me, write the book you want to read, isn't it? Or, or write, exact, no, write, exactly. write a TV show that you're not seeing um, because they can't, you know, what does it cost? It just costs, a, you, know, a, you know, a pad and a pen and you can imagine it. It costs nothing to imagine something. Um, it costs a lot to make it if you do. <laughs> anyway, that's another story. Um, so I'm really interested that you, you actually get ideas as I do actually from reading about genuine paranormal research and what really goes on in in that that world unusual events you know um the tried and trusted uh, trusted kind of stuff that gets gets uh, covered in 40 and times and such like or the, the the annals of the society for psychical research they're all for me great fodder for um just exploring new things really um so what do you think goes on when people in real life, I mean, not in fiction, what goes on when people experience echoes of the past, as you, as, as you memorably describe it, or presences or out of body experiences? Do you think science will ever explain the so-called paranormal? That's a wonderful question. Um, so I don't really know how many people listening to this have a personal experience of what they would call other supernormal phenomena or unexplained phenomena. Um, and I wouldn't necessarily say that I'm a, a full car, fully signed up believer. And then Stephen, I don't know about you, but I, I think you, I've heard you say before that you're- I'm quite skeptical to be honest. Quite skeptical. It doesn't stop me in no, no. having ghost stories and loving the science that goes with ghost stories. But, uh. But I, I have to say, I am also quite skeptical. But um, I was, I can remember a few years ago, a dear friend said to me, oh yes, the thing about the supernatural is I don't believe it. And he looked at me and then he said, but it does, sometimes it just strikes you, doesn't it? And that resonated with me because I do think that most people I know and most people we know can find at least one person in their life close to them who will say, I have had an unusual experience of some oh, sort. I do, I do definitely believe people have unusual experiences and, and that really intrig intrigues me. Uh, yeah. But yeah. I, I also think um, like UFOs, for instance, you, you've done a book about UFOs. Um, I like fiction about UFOs. I like fiction about ghosts. I think if someone turned around tomorrow and explained UFOs, uh, that really doesn't interest me whether people come up with the proof of it. It's people experience that interest me. 
and people's attempts to explain it this way, that way, or uh, and the stories they go through, the narratives they they live with from the experience. That's what interests me. Not is it or isn't it, you know. Yeah. But, so I, I I actually find that the the question in a way that I'm asking you, you know, do ghosts exist or not, is kind of irrelevant to me. It's certainly irrelevant when I'm writing fiction. And it's kind of irrelevant in life, really, because I think, first of all, you've got to spend 10 hours explaining what is the definition of ghost. Is, is ghost a belief in the afterlife or is it a belief that maybe memory creates something that outlives our body? Which, you know, so there's a million ways to define ghost. Is it just trauma that exists beyond the moment of trauma? Um, so I love that. I love the fact that you can't necessarily have a finite definition of what a ghost is in any case. And I think you capture that very much in in this book, The Haunted Shore, which is um, which I think that I think the past feel it does feel like echoes of the past, and it does feel like memories made tangible, you know. And whether whether we are sometimes um, uh, um, in tune with that or not in tune with it is is would always be interesting to us, I think, because that's something that many people feel from time to time. No, I completely agree. And I, to to return to our earlier conversation, when you're when you're writing about characters whose memory is fallible, or who are flawed by it could be an addiction. In this case, it is an addiction. Um, that means that their entire perception of the world that we've created is in doubt, and therefore the reader is in permanent suspense. Yeah. Hopefully, if we That's do our I, jobs, I always I, I, I was. I, I was I've taken a liking recently to say that doubt is a really important to the engine of a supernatural story. Oh, without yes. doubt, without doubt, the story becomes just fantasy. Absolutely. If you've got, out, if you've got doubt, that's why skepticism is so important in the story. If you've got doubt, then you've got friction in the story. And I think, uh, you know, you definitely use that. Well, that's um, exactly right. But, you know, I, have, I was going to say, picking up on something you just said about people who experience things and take it with them in life and actually that makes it really interesting dramatically um i wrote a book called the watchers about a spate of ufo sightings in the cold war and again the the, the whole point about that book isn't are there or aren't there ufos it's what happens to a person who is a young child who sees something completely inexplicable to them that nobody ever will believe later in life how do they take that forward with them in life how do they deal with that experience and i based that book on on a on a on a real life event where you know a classroom of kids in in west wales in 1977 did indeed report something that none of them could explain that they all stand up today and say they said that, that, that they said they you know that they didn't make it up and something affected them and they carry that with them and i think dramatically and for a writer that's just pure gold well, children children not being believed is an incredibly potent metaphor isn't it yeah <laughs> you know uh it's, it's very ins much so. inescapable in many ways um uh, you touched on this when we started i think actually but just to explore it a little bit more um what draws people to the scary and unnerving in fiction why do people want to be terrified i think you you've kind of answered that earlier on in a way unless you want to elaborate on it you you said it's kind of pleasurable a pleasurable fear because we know it's not actual fear yeah because you know i guess you know you can you can always turn the page on it when you've had enough uh and if we've done our jobs well enough as writers it's it, it's it, it's about keeping them going and keeping readers you know compelled to discover where the story goes next um but yeah, it's, I agree with you, Stephen. It's a it's a pleasurable fear, uh, and it's not just about the fear. It's about going with a, a character who has a unique and rather rare um, perception on life, and and uh, and sometimes that can be traumatic for the character, and it can leave the reader feeling quite relieved actually that you're not going through that as well. <laughs> yeah. So actually, when I think about it, if you, if you enjoy fantasy fiction you know it's not true. So it's the enjoyment of something you know is not true. But I think I think in Supernatural, it's almost enjoying something that might or might not be true. It's kind of more on the fringe territory. 
of what might be possible, depending, you know, mileage may differ kind of thing, because yeah. everyone listening to this will have a different um, barometer of what they believe in, or, or probably researchers would call it a gullibility scale or something <laughs> of what yes. they believe in, what they want. Some people would believe in ESP, some people would not believe in ESP, some people would be, believe that ghosts are discarnate entities, someone, someone else listening to this would not believe in ghosts at all. Um, so we all have we all have a gray scale that, that alters, I think. Um, but g getting a little bit to the craft of writing now, because I, I think uh, there may be writers tuning into this, hopefully. Um, how do you achieve scare moments or scenes when people are used to seeing them extremely well realized on the big screen? Is it possible for a book to be as scary as a scary film? Um. So I think they're two, it's a great question, Stephen, and I, I think they're two very different sorts of scares, right? And you all know better than me how to write a true jump scare for a film. It's hard, uh, enough, in, hard enough in a script, let alone in a book. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they're really done by directors, let's face it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and I, I, I think the medium is so, it's so different. Um, and I think for me, the, 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 not talking about my own work, but if I think about some of the, the stories that have truly scared me, and I think um, Susan Hill's The Woman in Black it has to be, the, for everyone here who's not read the original book, you know, there have been countless film adaptations, please go away and read that book because it is, it is crafted so brilliantly. And the, and, and the suspense and the dread will just builds steadily throughout. Am I right, Stephen? Yeah, I, I think that you've hit the nail on the head. For me, it's about suspense and dread and creating an atmosphere that won't let you go. And I think it's about, if it is about, it's not so much about fright moments, because in cinema, you can do that in a cut. You can do that in a close-up. You, you can't really do a cut in a close-up. Very rare instances of that working in a book, but you can have a creeping atmosphere and you can, uh, wonderfully, I think, in books that work like yours, um, feed things in that build, you know, and, and that's to do with getting inside characters and, and their point of view. Point of view of the voice of the book is very important. I mean, you can have point of view in the cinema, obviously, you're following a character usually, but you, yeah, you very rarely, unless actually in a found footage film, you're, you're maybe following the exact point of view, but that's another, that's another kettle of fish. But, uh, but in a book, you're inside someone's experience. Yes, and I was I was also going to say that uh, you know it's partly also about um, establishing an environment uh, which is sort of knowable and familiar, but at the same time, as you said earlier, you doubt it fundamentally. There's something not quite right in the environment, and less is often more. So in a book like this, you know there may be. There may be a, a supernatural presence, but if there is, it certainly won't be evident for most of the book. And I don't want to give anything away, uh, <laughs> obviously. Uh, but you know, less is more. And I think if you can steadily, this is one of the challenges of writing a book like this. It's a long form ghost story, and those are actually quite rare. That's one thing I was going to ask next about about the uh, you know three hundred <laughs> pages for a supernatural story is is, is a is a big ask you know but um i must say that there's one point in in your book and i won't say where it is but i won't say what it is but i thought holy shit i'll tell you what it is afterwards i don't want to give away to the people that are going to buy the book but i really do feel that and i thought well that's a real um shiver moment um or, or <laughs> what, what's gonna what's gonna happen now kind of thing but i'll tell you what it was later on uh philip kenyon asked do you ever feel scared? Do you ever feel scared yourself when you're writing your novel? Oh, hi, Philip. Um, I uh, do. I ever feel scared writing myself? Um, no, I wouldn't say so. To be honest, I I, I come to the page with a very uh, with a very um, clear rationale. Um, when I'm writing, and that is, I have a, I have a little post-it note that I put, I put I put above the screen, which is basically, don't bore, <laughs> <laughs> don't be boring. <laughs> don't be boring. That's a great one. Don't be boring. So your job as a writer is to entertain, entertain, entertain. 
and it's to keep people questioning, guessing and interested, I think. Um, so I don't sit there feeling frightened by what I'm writing. I sit there consciously asking myself, will, what effect will this so, have? So it doesn't really, you don't maybe, I mean, I can remember happening once when I'm, I was typing, like typing something at like two or three in the morning. I think I was really tired and, the, and I saw something out of the corner of my eye, you know, I thought it was the cat going upstairs and you think, hang on, we don't have a cat, you know, that kind of thing. That's uh -huh. happened to me a couple of times, but I think it's mainly when I'm pretty tired. Uh, um, there's something else here, a question from Michelle joining us on Facebook, asked yeah. uh, if you've both read Joe Hill, Stephen King's son, Joe Hill. I've yeah. read, I haven't read his novels, actually. I've read his short stories, which are really excellent. Um, but I haven't. Yeah. I, I so haven't um, I, think, I think that Joe Hill there's is... There's so many people to catch up with now. I mean, you know, even people that I know that are you know our own supernatural writers i mean i've got a stack of books to get through and that's just people i know I'm, let, alone, <laughs> um, let alone people i don't know um I, anyway i have read i haven't read many of his books um but i have read i think his first one um it was some years ago now but and i'm struggling actually to remember the title i was just looking but i have read it and i remember thinking just how impressed i was uh because he's He's obviously, I, th I could be completely wrong, but did he co-write The Institute with Stephen King? I'm sure that Stephen King wrote one of his books uh, with his yeah, son. Yeah. I, I, um, I think it was, wasn't it um, Sleeping Beauty he wrote with his other son, Owen King, I think? Oh, no, but that's... He, 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 was there one called... Um, no, but, from Overdrive, there was one called... Yeah, so the, one, the, the book that I read was recommended to me by um, my friend Toby, and that was Heart Shaped Box. Oh, yes, yes. yeah. Yeah. And that was, that, was, that was absolutely brilliant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I must get that. I must get that. Um, uh, uh, I'd like to pick up on something that you said, because to me, ghost stories are often effective when they're really short. Very yeah. often they are consist of someone saying, you're not going to believe what happened to me. You're really not going to believe what happened to me. This happened to me. End of story. <laughs> Very often they're that, and it's all down to the way it's told and the style it's told. Uh, now to pull that off with uh, 300 pages um, is a completely different kettle of fish. And uh, uh, you know how how on earth do you go about even conceiving that? Really? Um, I, I because you have to. You have to know when you're going to have your supernatural intruding into that story and you have to kind of pass it out uh, very carefully <laughs> so um to what extent do you plan and to what extent do you go by the seat of your pants so you're a pantser or a planner so in my in my in my uh i would say in my in life generally i go by the seat of my pants but <laughs> If you're writing a book, it, um, I had a tutor once uh, at school who said, um, Neil, it's really important to have a plan. <laughs> and that's always stuck with me. Yeah. Um, and so when I come to write a book, I think you've got to know, you've got to have a fair idea of where you're going. You've got to know. I don't know about you, Stephen, but I, I, I'm the same. But uh, you know, people. I mean, if you're writing, if you're writing, I, I couldn't a actually do it. Maybe it comes from screenwriting where you've got a plan. To get the job really you know they expect to see a plan before yeah. they sign off on it really and you know things can change along the way don't get me wrong you know you could have a million different endings but i can't can't really start something until i've got an idea of the ending because that would be horrible um so. and i completely i completely agree with you you know otherwise i mean the worst thing that happened and i'll share this with everybody on the call but um there was a book I wrote, it was The Burning House, and I handed in the manuscript. <laughs> and my editor was like, no, no, we you know this, there's various things to this that have to change that are wrong. Um, and she was absolutely right, actually. She was absolutely right. And I had to go back and I spent three months rewriting something. And I think I lost about 30,000 words in that book. But the finished result was so much better. And that just completely underlines the importance of having a really great editor. So the other piece of advice I give to anybody watching, if you want to get published, once you've got your book down on paper, get somebody to edit it. And I think that the tough thing is um, embellishing your point, really, 
uh, toughest thing about writing is, uh, I don't know whether people might say, oh, getting the ideas, selling the ideas, selling anything is difficult. But uh, I think as you get older, <laughs> it doesn't get any easier to know whether something's any good or not. Uh, I find you think that when you've written X number of scripts or X number of books, well, it must surely be, you must be sure that the next book works or the story works or that kind of thing. I, I find that, that as you actually get more professional, I think in a way you get more beset by doubt, if anything, which is peculiar. Um, or maybe that's a misperception from being on the inside. But uh, there's a question just popped up here from an anonymous attendee. Do you write a full draft before you go back and make revisions? As in completely following where your storyline is leading you before going back and re revisiting the initial plot? Uh, that's a really good question. Um, I will tend to write, I mean, I, I don't write in order often. So what will happen is I'll have various ideas. There are some scenes in this book um, which I occur towards the end, which I actually wrote at the beginning. Um, and then I'll write, I'll actually go back to the beginning and think, okay, so the first quarter of the book has to achieve various things. You have to establish your characters. You have to establish the location. You have to understand their flaws. You have to understand where they're going and what they want and what they need and what they can't get. And if, once you establish all of those things and you know the rest of the stuff to come, I then start assembling it. So I'll, there'll be a lot of moving things around and work, seeing what's work, what works and what doesn't. And then when I've got a finished manuscript, I will um, put it down for a while, go back to it, um, rework it, and sometimes do have, I'll do give it readers, some... Do you have readers, um, what they call beta readers, that you would try try stuff out on that are not uh, in, in your publisher? I mean, kind of unofficial people that would give you feedback? Yeah, yeah, no, I do. Um, I, I'll show it to um, my editor, and I'll I, I tend not to show it to share it with friends, except that there's a very good friend um, on this call. Uh, I think he's still on the call, um, who actually helped inspire the ending to this book, uh, and that was that was fantastic because it was a couple of years ago. We were sitting in a restaurant, and I told him I had this idea for this novel, and he said to me, "Do you know what would be really good?" He said, "I think it's good." He said, "But I think what would be great is if you did this at the end." And I remember my, you know, I had this jaw dropping moment and I thought, yes, no, you're right. That would be great. And he, so I'm very thankful to him for that. But I have to say, uh, you know, a lot of people I speak to who want to write will often be very sort of guarded about talking about their work or discussing defensive, it. Defensive, really, I think. Very defensive. Yeah. And my advice is actually, you know, get feedback, you know, discuss it with people. If something doesn't work. Not about it's not about giving it, oh, well, I'll choose him to give feedback because I know he'll say he likes it. But it's not about whether someone likes it or not. In fact, you should say, I don't need to know whether you like it or not. Just read it. See if anything doesn't work. It's almost a mechanical uh, question. You know, is there a bit that confused you? Is there a bit that was not clear? Is yeah. That you thought was a bit naff? You know, th those kind of things, which are actually, if they're mechanical questions, you can put them right, you know saying you like it or don't like it doesn't really help because that's down to who the person is and the next person might like it or not like it so that's it's it's just it's just getting getting actually tangible advice on something really um there's another question popped up here um considering how you were mentioning location as being a factor sorry this is simon fogo don't know if you know who that is but it's simon hello simon hi simon considering how you were mentioning locations as being a factor in your stories have you had much feedback from locals in whose settings are in the novel. Uh, living in South London, I'm quite delighted recognizing places as landmarks, e.g. the use of the cinema in Brixton and descriptions of the streets, as an example of the old idea that recognition brings us pleasure, perhaps. Uh, it's, it's more to do with using locations that I'm familiar with, and I think I can help hope, hopefully convey in a, in, a, in a convincing way that helps to establish the reality of the, of the, of the world the novel set in. Um, but what I would say is that, yes, I have met people in these locations the books are set in uh, that do often drop the most tantalizing th things into conversation. So, for example, um, I wrote a book called The Ghost Hunters, which was set in a village called Borley, 
uh, as in a Bordy Rectory in Suffolk. And uh, I met somebody there who said, look, you have to understand that I can't talk about stuff that goes on here because I have to live here in the village. Um, and she presented herself initially as a sort of very well-to-do sceptical lady who'd lived there for, you know, ages. And, um, and then when I said to her that we'd had heard reports of um, odd sounds, unusual sounds coming from the roadway, she said, oh yes, people do keep saying that. And her face sort of clouded over, you know, and she <laughs> suddenly <laughs> broke eye contact. And actually, um, similarly in, in, in South Wales, uh, where the, the watchers is set, there, I actually met a number of people who said that yes, there were all sorts of unusual things have gone on in this village for many years, um, but they don't feel they can talk about them. Now, I don't make any judgment about whether those things are real or not, but I do think they make great ideas for, for, for yeah. students. <laughs> I'll, yeah, I'll have that. Thank you very much. He says, scribbling furiously in his notebook. Um, um, I've got a question in earlier from Andy Barker. Uh, asking about, do you have a number of projects that you work out at any one time? Are you kind of juggling things? Uh, and subsidiary to that, really, uh, I'd like to know a little bit, and I'm sure everyone else would, about your working method and what is a typical day and that kind of thing. You can describe that a little bit because every writer is different in my experience. Yeah. Um, so I don't write full time completely. So I do corporate work as well. And so that balancing writing with that, when, I'm, when I am doing corporate work, I tend to write at weekends or in evenings. Um, otherwise, I will, if I'm working at home on a book, I will either work in, in my apartment or I will take myself off to a coffee shop and sit and watch the world go by and, you know, headphones in and, and, and write away. But I can't write necessarily completely on demand always. I have to wait for things, ideas to come to me and I have to feel compelled and inspired to do so. Uh, a glass of wine often helps. But do you, um, do you, do you wait until you finish one novel to, to dream up the next one? Or do you have, say, other things on the back burner that you're, I can't, you know, like for instance, I'm dying to get on with that one. Maybe it's not quite right. Maybe you need another element, or yeah. I mean, so that's, this, that's, this, I'm describing myself really, to be honest. <laughs> I'm wondering if you, you probably have a number of things going on. I mean, a number of things at the same time, right? I mean, scripts for different production companies. Yeah, yeah, and certain things take natural priority, I think. But um, but, but a, a novel, three hundred page novel, takes a big commitment, so you can't juggle too many things when you've got that. Well, it, it's, it's a really interesting question because this book, I, I was halfway through writing this when I was in the middle of writing The Burning House, which is up here, here behind me somewhere. Um, uh, but this is just because this book was very, very, very important to me. It was very special to me because it comes from a very personal place. Um, and at the moment I'm working on another novel. Uh, at the minute it's all in note form and it's all in my head. I haven't put anything on the page yet but it's an idea for a series of books, a series of six or seven books about one particular character who's completely fictitious. Uh, but at, at the moment, I'm just thinking the scale of that project is too immense to even to begin writing. I just want to plot out a world in notebooks and see what happens. Fantastic. God. That's daunting, but exciting. <laughs> we'll see what happens. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Could be rubbish. <laughs> um, so you've actually said, would, would that be next or is that a long time thing for you? Is that no, like a, a way off or would it be, would it start with your next book or you're not sure? Yeah, I think it'll start with the next one. Yeah. Oh, great. And does that so we'll have see what happens. supernatural element again or? Uh, it does have a supernatural element um, and it is, I've got an idea about a jury and this jury is in a very, very, very awkward position and an awkward place and they have to make obviously they have to reach a verdict um but th th this idea has been kicking around in my head for for years and i finally found a way in and Fantastic. for me that's that's always yeah, yeah, yeah. that's always the key is unlocking it yeah, God, yeah. You must, um, so we'll see what happens <laughs> yeah i don't know it, it, people say where do you get ideas but it's not it's, i always say it's not just an idea ideas are actually a cluster of different things that come together to make an idea it's not just one you might have part of it wandering around in your head for 10 or 15 years 20 years 
until it gets it's, the other bit. It's kind of like the molecule rather than the. Uh, that is so. That is so true. <laughs> does anybody? Does anybody else have any questions before we wrap up? All right, we're not wrapping got, up yet. I've got to We've the. Got I've minutes, really got yeah. to the. I've got to the end of. Uh, got to the end of my questions really apart, apart from what do you see maybe what do you see do you see in the future of the genre do you are people going to get bored of spooky stories anytime soon obviously not but can you see a, a way that no, it's, it's our bread and butter we, we're going to be on the street with a with a begging bowl um <laughs> no but is there a, is there a change in what people uh like do you think do you perceive that or do you prefer not to analyze that as such from the outside do you let marketing people worry about that and just go with your instinct i think people there will always be a market for story which uh evoke a, a, a sense of uh, unsettlement or uh you know stories which play on folklore particularly on folklore um because folklore is such an it's so intrinsically related to a sense of place uh, and and I, I i honestly don't think there's anywhere better than the british isles in terms of the quality and depth of folklore that we have so that's a that is a rich um source of material which i think will always be relevant uh you and you only have to look at you know the content that netflix are currently putting out um the haunting of bly manor which was actually something i wanted to ask you about this is an adaptation of a classic book. Yeah. You can tell everyone which book it is. Yeah, The Turn of the Screw. Yeah. The Turn of the Screw. Yeah. But I swear when you and I met uh, as a, a book festival some years ago, you, you mentioned that you had a very similar, a very similar idea for a show. Well, well the, uh, no, not really for the show. Well, uh, well you've mentioned it already, The Awakening. Which was my ghost hunter story was actually originally a um, sequel to Turn of the Screw. Um, the, the ghost hunter character played by uh, Rebecca Hall, her name, if you remember, is Florence. Yes, and of course. The original idea was that it was Flora, the little girl from Turn of the Screw, when she grows up. My, the, it started off being, you know, because I don't know if you remember at the end of, at, you know, before the climax of Turn of the Screw, when the governess faces Miles. Uh, the little girl is sent and packed off and um, it occurred to me one day as ideas do what happened to Flora and I had in my mind oh, you know 20 years later she's grown up but she's kind of in denial about having grown up in a haunted house with Quint and Miss Jessa what if she completely is in denial about that and does the reverse and becomes a ghost hunter trying to disprove ghosts yeah. and then through the process of the story she discovers what her real past is that was the original story and it, be it became Cherry like everything it becomes changed over the years and became the awakening which was instead of set in 1880 it was set in 1920 so well, that's hollywood or rather that's bbc film <laughs> well i can wholeheartedly say uh to everybody watching this that um if you've not seen the awakening by stephen Bo, please please do go away and watch it um because like, halloween even uh, well, what are you doing at Halloween? That was my final question. <laughs> what am I doing for Halloween? Watching The Awakening. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, apart um, from that, yeah. <laughs> it all depends on where we are with lockdown. But um, I'll be, I'll be, I'll be walled up somewhere. I'm currently in South Wales. So yeah, um, thank you so much, everybody, for for joining us today. Um, I should one of the thank you. It's been great. I've really enjoyed catching up. I mean, you know, we've Stephen, I, a couple of times before, and it's really nice to have a decent conversation about the things lovely. we love. It's been lovely, and for everybody watching, I would just like to thank a few people. Um, chief amongst them, uh, really, uh, the, my publishers um, and my editors, Steph and Charlie. Uh, I would like to thank um, also Millie, my publicist, and the marketing team at Quirkus Books. Uh, my agent Catherine Summerhays, but specifically also the Notting Hill Bookshop, um, because I know the Notting Hill Bookshop are signing, uh, are selling signed copies of the Haunted Chore, and you can find, you can order those on on their website, um, and um, Howard Malin uh, as well for Howard's dear support. Um, yeah, it's been great. But Stephen, uh, can, I just, can I just say if you want to know more about me, my website, uh, Stephen Volk. S-T-E-P-H-E-N-V-O-L-K dot net. 
and anything I'm doing is on there or links to the books I've done. So and, and can we can we just repeat that for everybody, Stephen? Stephenvote.net. Stephenvote.net. Yeah. Yeah. And to everybody watching, please go and check out Stephen's uh, work and his books because they are incredible. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. Really appreciate it. Well, I hope you enjoyed our rambling. Um, it's an even chillier night than it was when it started, I hope. I hope we've given you the willies in a suitable fashion and informed you a little bit if you're a budding writer or just interested in ghosts. Um, I hope it's done you some good. And uh, good night. Don't have nightmares. <laughs> Don't have nightmares. Thank you very good much, night. everybody. Good night. Good night.